In this video, we're going to dissect one of the most common questions we get asked, which is how do I protect my energy before, during, and after deep coaching calls? This is a fascinating conversation to me. It's an important one because it's real for a lot of people. I say it's fascinating because it, it's really common for people to have a resistance around coaching all because of the idea that they don't want to get all washed away in other people's energy. So one of the most common questions that I get, and I'm sure you do to some degree too, is how do you protect your energy? How, cause I don't want to, and it's usually kind of asked in a statement kind of way, you know, like our ego always sort of justifies our protection mechanisms and our sabotage. So it usually sounds something like, how do you protect your energy because, and then justification comes. And I'm not saying this to be dismissive, uh, but this is just the way I see it. And this is how almost all of us are sabotaging ourselves anyway through justification. So I don't mean to, to sound mean or demeaning when I say this, but then people will say, you know, because I, I'm in the energy with people and then I'm all caught up and then I don't know what to do afterwards and I'm still connected to their energy and so forth. And a lot of people use the word empath in that justification or in that explanation, at least. And, you know, I don't even know about that word. I mean, I personally, I don't even know what the working definition is of that word. And, and I think it's somewhat easy for us to self-diagnose as empath or empathic, uh, because I don't think there's a clear definition. I know you have some relatively strong feelings and thoughts about that yeah. word itself and what it means and how people are using it. Well, I, and I, I, I did, I Googled it because I was curious what, you know, cause if the internet says it's so, then it's official and it's real. Um, then it's absolutely real. Um, and, and according to the top result on Google, an empath is a person with you know, the paranormal ability to apprehend the mental or emotional state of another individual. And paranormal that, ability. Yes, okay. sir. Mm -hmm. That's that adds a wrinkle to it. Mm -hmm. I think that it's gotten more loosely used to be, I have a lot of empathy, right? So I think there's a, there's a distinction between I have this ability to actually like take on and, and, and pull in and I mean, apprehend, that's significant, that word in there, another person's mental or emotional state versus I, I have a lot of empathy. And what I recognize in uh, myself. Well, before you go on there, but before you, you, you go on there, I, I just want to highlight this distinction. I think a lot of us say I am an empath because I feel things and an empath feels other people's feelings. And that doesn't necessarily mean somebody feels feelings in the presence of another person. And that's an empath. So I, I think that's, and maybe where you're going to go, but that's kind of what you were alluding to. That just because like if somebody's sad and you feel sadness in the presence of another person being sad, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're an empath. It means that you're feeling feelings. And, and, and again, I'm not trying to be dismissive. I'm just, we're just, we need to get clarity on what the definition is that we're using in order to be able to talk about it properly. And so in our Google affirmed definition of empathy or empath, we're talking about a human's paranormal ability to apprehend somebody else's feelings. So now you're feeling somebody else's feelings. And that's different than you feeling your own feelings that are attached to somebody else or related to, or just in the presence of somebody else. So I think that distinction is really clear or really important. And like you said, we've become pretty loose in our understanding of what an empath is. Now the question, how do you manage your emotions is still valid. So we're gonna still open that question up whether we use empath as a label or not. So we're gonna you know, help you protect your energy and all the things that we've learned. But I think that empath label 
is an important one to understand because if we're misusing it, then it's actually probably not helping us in, oh. in our journey. Because another way that we can use this is um, what I found in my own self. And just because of things that I experienced as a child, I became very, very hyper aware, um, like hyper vigilant and, and very aware of the feelings of the people around me. Right. So one of my, what am I feeling right now? Right. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. Oh, okay. I am protected. <laughs> you are protected. <laughs> But I like, I mean, that was a, a response that I had to my trauma was I got very um, overly uh, aware of the, the feelings of the people around me because it's how I managed to stay safe. So one of the behaviors that I developed was a, I took responsibility for the feelings of other people. So if, if you were, if, if you, Sean, were upset then I took it to be, this is like, I needed to tap into your upsetness. I needed to be aware of it. And then I needed to try and fix it because I needed to try and fix you so that I could actually feel better because I was taking this emotional responsibility for, for your, your energy and how you were moving through the world. And, and all of that made sense. That sounds healthy and fun. Absolutely. Uh, made a lot of sense when I was a little kid, right? Trying to get my needs met. But as what you just joked about as an adult trying to function, it was exhausting, right? So I was very, I had to be very aware of how does this person feel? How does my friends feel? How do my clients feel? And I, I honestly would manipulate right? Other people because I needed to feel better and I didn't feel good if they didn't feel good. And so in, in that conversation, if I mislabel my um, codependency or I mislabel my, um, my trauma, like um, a protection, my, my trauma response, if I mislabel that as being an empath, to what you were saying a moment ago, I'm not actually going to do the work that I did do to say, oh snap, this is this is not me being an empath. This is me acting out of my wounds. I right. need to heal that. If I'm if I call that, oh well, I'm just an empath, now I'm not gonna do the, I'm not gonna do the thing that's actually going to allow me to to feel better and have a better experience of life and let all of the other people in my life off of the hook for, for my own personal happiness. So that's why I think it's so important that we are honest with ourselves about what's going on so that we can actually take the the real action that's required for us to protect our energy. Yeah, that was a really good explanation and breakdown and the reason why we want to be really clear on the boundaries of this label empath, because it is something that we can use as avoidance. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to experience whatever the wounds are or whatever it is that we need to do to look in the mirror. It's just easier to sweep it under the rug under the label empath. And we do that with all kinds of labels, not just empaths. So we're not like honing in on this one particular label here. And, and hopefully it's not demeaning in any way because it's actually advocacy for health. It's advocacy for you to do whatever work needs to be done and for you to understand the, the boundaries between yourself and the client and whose energy is whose and how to protect yours and even understand what's yours and what's theirs. And based on the, the Google definition, which, I mean, there can't be another source it's of, law. of any validity. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how anybody defined words like before Google. Was that even possible? I mean, people just must've been so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, but I like the working definition at least. Um, yeah. Most attachment to feelings is not empathy, or at least it's not paranormal empathy. Right. It's just feeling. And yeah. now we can talk about triggers and how we get attached to those feelings and what we make those feelings mean. Like you made it mean that you did something wrong if anybody else was feeling anything less than awesome. So we're teaching all of this and, and dissecting it from a place of advocacy not just for you, but also for your client. Because ew, if 
you're holding on to the label empath. And really what you're doing is bleeding on your client. <laughs> really, if you're coach bleeding on your clients, then, but it's just under the, the guise of empath, then you're not helping them. You're not helping you. Nothing is actually getting uh, helped or, or fixed or focused on in a healthy way. And now everybody just gets messy. Buddy. That's such a disgusting, such a disgusting visual. <laughs> Are you coach bleeding on your clients? Or maybe we should call it bleed coaching. That might be, or blood coaching, blood coaching. I like that best. Yes. Are you blood coaching on your clients? Ugh. All right. Some where like do we go from here? This is where I throw it over to you. Now yeah, you... is some maxi pad or band aid the sponsor of this of this video? Pepto Bismol, not Pepto Bismol this time. <laughs> I don't think so. Not All for right, that was the other video. Ah, <laughs> uh, so so then, how do we protect our energy? Right. Yeah, so I, what... I forgot like what we were even talking about. So I'm <laughs> I'm totally in trauma protection mode right now. Uh, my eyes. Erase, That's my erase, eyes. erase. <laughs> All right, take it away. Look into the pen. So, so yeah. So, how do we protect our energy? You can't pull out that pen based on the conversation. Wait, show that thing again. You can't be talking about maxi pads and all that stuff and pull that thing out with that shape and think that I see a pen. That is not what I saw. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Yeah, only up. <laughs> I feel like. Only up. Ah. Uh, so, okay. Let's go back to, back to the beginning. The question that a lot of people have, regardless of label of empath and pads and all that stuff, is how do I protect my energy? And yeah. even if you are an empath, I think, again, not knowing all the Google definitions, but I think this will apply to anybody, whether we have the label or not, because this is really energy protection. And this is where it's appropriate, uh, you know, regardless of the labels. Mm -hmm. So what's your yeah. answer when people ask you how you protect your energy in coaching or how you suggest they protect their energy in coaching? Well, I don't love the question. <laughs> um, I don't love the question of, of protection because to me that that means that there's like something that I need to like guard myself like from. Um, so yeah, to me, I think a, a better question is how can I be present with my clients and stay unattached? Right? How do I <laughs> do that? I was gonna say what? How do I guard my energy? How do I not feel like, I mean, joke, I'm joking, but that's actually what a lot of people are actually asking, you know? Mm -hmm. And if we dive into that, what people are asking for, not consciously, but the solution they're actually looking for is how do I not feel? Mm -hmm. How do I not, because, you know, I think a lot of us have a negative relationship with the idea of emotions and yeah. our own emotions. And so we think if we feel emotions, especially in a coaching context, when we're supposed to have it all together and be yeah. leading the show and all that stuff, then it's just going to be this runaway, messy human that can't do anything. So right. we want to also be really clear that there's nothing wrong with feeling like that's a part of the human connection and it's impossible to, I'm going to use manage. I don't love that word, but it's impossible to manage your emotions in a way that's useful to you as a coach until you embrace the fact you have emotions. So a lot of this goes back to permission and embracing and, and, and acknowledging the fact that if you're a human, you got emotions. So now how can we use those emotions, use the human experience rather than guard or protect or anything that, that does create that disconnect? How can we use it in a useful way? Go ahead. Sorry, I jumped in on you there. No, I love that you did. Yeah, Because I mean, I, I just... 
Yeah. The protection. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't like that. I think first is um, what we were just talking about is understanding what you're, how you're showing up inside of the, inside of the session. So doing your own work to have a healthy relationship with your own emotions. Um, right. To me, that's, that's critical. Um, I, I think it's really important for me. I have time before my coaching sessions that allows me to just get present and grounded. And I set an intention for the conversation that, that I'm about to step into. So for me, there's also a preparation on the front end of like, okay, I have an alarm that goes off a couple of minutes before my calls. Let me just close my eyes. I take a couple of deep breaths. And, and just for me, I think about what's what's my intention for this coaching session or this conversation that's coming up. And I tell the, the clients that, I'm, that I mentor, the coaches that I mentor, to figure out what your own ritual is with that so that you're preparing yourself and, and going into the session in a way that is, that's clean, right? So that I'm not actually coming into the session, bringing all of, of my baggage and triggers and other things that are coming through the day. So I think that's an important first step. The idea of a ritual is an interesting one. In the sports world, mm. one of the things that the highest level mindset coaches teach is rituals. And the reason why is because a ritual provides a sense of stability and a sense of control in an environment where those are not present or an environment where our emotions can get to us or our nerves can get to us. So like in basketball, pretty much all good basketball players have a ritual at the free throw line. You know, they'll bounce the ball a certain number of times and the best players never deviate from their ritual. It's yeah. a thing that they can use their mind to focus on and when the mind has something to focus on, it doesn't focus on all the things that it can't control. So for a lot of people who are a little anxious going into coaching calls or nervous or downright terrified, having a ritual provides something that your brain can find comfort in. Even if it's just a few minutes ahead of time that you read through notes or you do push-ups or close your eyes and, and think of an image or something that's comforting, uh, that ritual to the, to, to the neurological brain provides an element that for a lot of people is missing. So that, that uh, ritual piece is huge. And then during the session, for, for me, I'm not, I'm not there like, I'm not listening to the story like I'm watching a movie, right? I'm, I'm in the, like, I'm fully in the role of the coach. And so the way that I, the way that I listen in, in that environment is not the same as if you and I went to coffee and you were just sharing a story with me, right? Where in that space, I am just going to be, I want to say that I'm going to be more open and I don't mean that I'm closed in my sessions because I, I am open, but it's like different faculties are open. Yeah. Right? I think so, I know it, if, if I could jump in and, and offer a phrase, it's like more active listening yes. rather than just passive observing. Yeah. And I'm glad you are explaining that because listening is much more active from a coaching standpoint than just normal listening or watching a movie or listen to somebody's story. And so a lot of people who are basing their question of how do I not get sucked into the emotion, if they're basing that question based on passive listening, then that's actually a different skill and a, a, a different resource in your body when you're actively listening as a coach for all the reasons that you'll probably uh, dive into here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, 
I think that inside of the, the, when I'm actively listening as a coach and when the, when you are actively listening as a coach, you're, you're like, you're looking for things. You're looking for their, we could, we teach it in our program, sensory acuity, right? You're, you're looking for movements in their body. You're, you're noticing like, oh, your hand just went up to your ear. You're noticing small shifts in their head or in their tone of voice because you're looking for an, uh, an emotional connection to things that they're saying. So I'm, I'm listening for the purposes of, of, with a desire to understand so that I can help guide them on a transformation. I'm not listening just for the purposes of empathizing where if we were just uh, yeah, going out right for a coffee, then I'm just, I'm connecting with you as, as a friend with no um, expectation that you're wanting anything more than just to share your story. If somebody is coming to us inside of a coaching relationship and conversation, they're, they're looking for, there's an outcome, right? There's a, a desire and, Hey, these are my intentions for the call today. Um, and that's, that, that's different. And that doesn't mean that inside of a session, I haven't, um, been like noticed that I got like emotional, Right, that something that they shared, like really, like it, it touched me. And and there's been times that I've teared up on on a session, right? Or I've gotten like really like excited about something, right? I got really passionate about about something. So it's not always like what we um, tend to hold on to because I think this question of how do you switch off emotions, we're using it in more of like a heavy emotion or a, a negative emotion, which I don't, I don't like that label. Um, but I think inside of the, the excitement and the joy and the passion, we can also get caught up in, in those things. And so if I recognize that that's happening for myself, a question that I, I ask is like, Ooh, have I made this about me? Like, have I, in, in that moment, like, have I, it does, it's not a big deal to me as a client, if I'm sharing like a, a, a pain or something with my coach and they, have a connection with that where they maybe they get a little bit choked up that doesn't bother me but if my coach is like having an emotional meltdown and now it's become about them where I feel like as the client I have to like soothe them and tell them it's okay that's 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 not like now it's gone too far um <laughs> for, for for me now you know um, you're, you're in some blood coaching <laughs> now you know you're in some blood coaching so in in those in those moments, I just, I have a, an anchor that I will do that if I do find myself getting triggered, which it happened more early on in my journey than it does to me now. Um, but I have an anchor that there's something that I'll do that I can bring myself back to the present moment. And for me, it's just, I snap my fingers three times. So it's, and that will, if I find myself inside of a session, like I'm kind of being swept up in their story and I'm no longer in that position of a coach, then I have that anchor that I can use to pull myself back into the present moment. That doesn't have to be your thing. It might be you like pinch your leg or, you know, uh, grab your right scream. thumb or scream. That works really, scream really well. Down. Absolutely. Uh huh. Yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. So active listening. <laughs> Uh, we did a video on this and mm -hmm. it's, it's actually one of the most powerful and critical skills of coaching Yeah, that a lot of people aren't focused on it because it, it's not something that you actually see, you know, it, it's not something that a lot of people who want to be coaches are paying attention to. We're paying attention to what's being said. Maybe we're watching the movements, but transformational listening that, that that's, that's a mastery level coaching skill. And so we'll put a card up here, uh, put a link in the description to watch that video. There's four elements to this kind of transformational listening that we're talking about. So you've talked about before the call, you talked about during the call. Uh, what about after the call? Because I think that's where most people are coming from mm -hmm. is what to do after the call because they have the experience of, like being on the phone with somebody telling a story, maybe somebody else's uh, emotions are wrapped up into some event that was, uh, you know, negative or, or positive, And they just feel like after 
they hang up, they're still feeling some of those feelings. And I think that's what a lot of people are using as evidence of this question, meaning that a lot of people haven't been in a coaching session, but they're just thinking about what they might do in a coaching session based on like friendly stories or something like that. So I think this is where a lot of people are coming from. And the main thing is what do you do afterwards when I can't stop thinking? Like I heard something over the phone and I'm in a bad mood for the rest of the day. So then why yeah. would I do this thing called coaching when I'm helping people with their problems? And that just means I'll be in a bad mood for the rest of the day. So what do or you do I'll afterwards? Be exhausted. Like, that's another thing I hear, right? I'll be exhausted. Like, oh my gosh, this is so yeah. draining, right? I don't have the energy for this. I think number one is to understand that the other two things are a critical component, right? Like we don't need to just react to something. We can prepare ahead of time so that the reacting afterwards isn't as necessary. Um, so I'll tell you what I do real quick before you, you dive in a little bit further. If- screen. I scream during, but then I just stay in a bad mood. Oh, oh well, that's so a then, choice. Right. So then after the calls, it doesn't like nobody can tell the difference. I so that's like one it. thing that I've mastered. So bad mood, like all the time. Yeah. Just all the time. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. So that's one option. That's one option. Um, yeah. <laughs> which is great. You're a choice people. Um, so, uh, it, for me, it's about, I got to bring myself back into the present moment. So um, I get up, right? I usually will coach if I'm on Zoom, I tend to be sitting. I don't usually stand uh, when, I'm, when I'm coaching on Zoom. So you got to be aware of when you're standing up on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> That's where preparation before the call is really important. It's called camera awareness. Clothing. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I'll stand up. So, it, you know, for you, just shift your body position, get up and get out of the space that you're in. Um, movement. So shake, like just move something, right? Shake your hands, shake your feet. Um, you could tap your legs or your arms. And, and, and the other thing is get like, get out, get outside, right? Take a deep breath, change your environment, get out of the room that you're in. Even if it's just briefly to go, like that's where my hall is. That's why I'm looking that way. Just go stand in the hall, just stretch, shake out the space that you were in and then re-enter. I will also finalize like any notes that I have and then close that window. So I close the client tab. I close the Zoom meeting. Like I want to create you know, we tend to leave a lot of open loops, right? And we leave like, you know, tabs open or windows open, or we leave, you know, a, a light on for our camera and we don't like shut it down. And if that thing's done, then be done with that and, and get off of that and then open up something, open up something new. So those physical things, um, if it was a, a really um, intense session or a really deep session. Um, I oftentimes will get off and I know you said this a little bit in jest, but I'm like, whoa, like I will breathe it out and, and shake it out just to release any of that energy, um, that, that might be in, in my body. If you're, if you're spiritual and you have a practice around cleansing energy, I have Palo Santo on my desk. So sometimes I'll smudge that, or you might light a candle if that's in your, that's in your thing. It's like sage. So it's like a, a wood. Um, th this is from Peru. It's a, a wood that I just burn that just is like a clearing, like a cleaning energy. Um, so that's something that, that I'll do sometimes. Um, I will also ground myself. So let me get my myself up out of this space. And what I mean by grounding for me, that's, let me get my feet on the earth. Right. So let me just go outside. Let me put my feet on the, on the ground. Let me do the things that are going to help bring me back into the present moment. And, and the last thing that I'll say in this is that if you do find yourself that you're getting, that you did get triggered, maybe your client brought up something that, you know, touched something in you that you were like, Oh, I didn't realize that was still a thing. Then make a little note of it and then reach out to your coach after the call right? Get the support that you need because you recognize, oh, they said something that that activated me. And what I found is that just making the note, right? 
it, it gives it enough attention, like in that moment, but we don't have to chase it down, right? I can say, right. oh, I recognize this and I can deal with you later. Yeah, I think that's a huge piece of it that there's, there's a process to follow. And with emotions in general, the less fear that we have around emotions, the more we'll be able to manage them because we're not afraid of them coming in and disrupting our entire life. So that's just more of an essential relationship that we have to the idea of emotions and triggers and, and so forth. Um, I don't generally have some of those practices that you mentioned, um, you know, post-call arson and, and things that you burn. Um, mine is just <laughs> arson. <laughs> Never really heard that as a suggestion. <laughs> Just uh, Y'all let me know. Yeah, take a match and light something on fire. <laughs> it certainly helps to give you something else to focus on. <laughs> and you know the idea. Now, clear out this bad energy. <laughs> The idea of what we're plugged into is an important one to understand. You know, it's like I always think of the the cord, the the power cord. What are we plugged into? If we're plugged into a certain outlet, then we're going to get whatever's coming from that outlet, and we can't keep that thing plugged into the outlet and focus on it and then not feel whatever it is that that outlet has for us. And so a very simple thing that I always think about is just plug into something else, take that cord and plug into something else or not like not even unplug from anything, just focus your energy on something else. Uh, but expression is one of the big things, whether it's writing down or writing on your notes, as you said, that you're going to talk to somebody else about this, whether it's a mastermind that you have or your own coach or whatever. Uh, or just journal writing, you know, that's one of the ways to create more of a flow relationship with emotions in general. And therefore, whenever emotions show up, whether it's in our coaching or anywhere else in our life, we are much more welcoming and open to the presence of the emotion. And therefore, we actually have more control. Right. I think most of us have been taught that because emotions are scary, the way you control your emotions is you avoid them. And if you don't feel emotions, then that's how you control them. But that actually creates a fear of the presence of emotion. And we're actually not afraid of the feeling of the emotion as much as we become afraid of the existence of the emotion. Mm. Like just the idea that we have emotion is what we become afraid of because then we don't know how to deal with it. But the presence of emotion and just the natural flow and sensations that emotions bring with them, this is a natural human experience. And the more that we're open to that, the easier things will flow through us. And then if we do get hooked on something because we did get triggered and it's something that we need to uh, dive into with our coach, it's easier to recognize those things because they'll reveal themselves as a, hey, this is something that you really need to work on here. So rather than this fear of, oh my goodness, I'm coaching and I don't want to feel emotions. The other thing is, unless you get to the point that as the coach, unless you fall into that place that you alluded to a while ago, where the coach is now needing to be rescued from their emotions, Unless you get to that place, having emotions as a coach and even getting triggered and even asking, I've had this happen where I am the coach. And for whatever reason, I, I, I do get engaged in the emotion of a story or somebody's experiences and, and I'll just pause or I'll ask for a moment and just allow myself to feel the human energy of what was just shared. And that in itself does not 
does not diminish your credibility as a coach or your authority. You don't lose authority just by having emotions. There is a line that can be crossed where all of a sudden the coach has become the victim and they need to be rescued. But just the presence of human emotion doesn't mean that you now are a terrible coach or that your client will now not respect you. And the more that we change our relationship to us as humans and we don't decide that having emotions means weakness and all the things that so many of us are programmed uh, to believe, then the more powerful of a coach we are because we, we actually want to be connected. You know, we just opened that up in, in one of our other videos. We want to feel connection as a coach. And that actually puts us in a place of facilitation and holding a space better than to protect ourselves from our emotion and therefore actually have disconnect between us and the client. And all of that is a part of what you mentioned uh, as we talked about active, connected, engaged, transformational listening. I love what you said because it's so important. We want our clients to feel, well, I want my clients to feel safe in their own emotional expression. So if I don't trust myself with my emotional expression and the ability to be with them while they're present, and I'm protecting in that because I don't think it's okay to have those, then that energy, even if we don't say it, right, Sean, that's going to come across to our clients and they might not feel safe in their own emotional expression in our presence because they'll pick up on the fact that we're not, we're not okay with that. And and just the ability when you mentioned that of just like, whoa, I need a minute. I loved that because there's a there's an honoring of of That's the emotion. That's the word that I was just thinking of. Go ahead. Yeah, That's the word. It's so many people, and I've totally done this, have in my journey of becoming comfortable with emotional expression and allowing that to be safe, we drop, like we just rush through it, right? We're on to the next thing. We're on to the next thing. And sometimes there's, there needs to be this beautiful, like, whoa, that was like, I felt that or, or that was really deep or, or that I like, I, I, I'm, when I say I felt that, like, I mean, I felt my feelings in response to your story, not I felt your stuff. I felt my stuff. And, and let's just be with this for a minute. And that shows it's a leadership in, in showing our clients that our emotions are to be revered. And they're they're sacred, and they deserve to be honored. And we, it's we want to allow space for that, and and so we're modeling that in those in those moments versus the the question, which I, I understand the come from on it, but how do I protect? Means like this isn't good, and this is dangerous, and I need to guard myself, you know, shield myself from this this thing versus. How can we both be with this thing in, in its, and just be with its presence and honor its presence? Yeah. So that's a better question is how can I honor mm -hmm. the energy, my energy, their energy, our combined energy. And that's going to be a much more useful and a, a healthier come from. So as always, if you want support in any of this, conversation, internal stuff, external stuff, then click the link in the description and you can book a free one-on-one -on -one consultation with one of our certified coaches and we can support you individually in any way that we can. You know, emotions are an individual journey. So if you have further questions, uh, the individual focus is uh, what you're going to need. And we also offer memberships on the channel. So take a look at the, the membership levels and see if any of those are going to be a good fit for you. Now, if you like this video, take a look at that video right there, which is essentially a masterclass 
on how to break down your goals so that you actually achieve them. But they don't believe in that. And they hold out for this $3,000 for any kind of ego reason. The chance that they'll be able to sell that $3,000 